can all hope for the best thing that you can possibly hope for, because why the hell not? And so that's the best thing that I can possibly hope for, and I think that we're capable of doing it. I truly do believe that. And so, that's all I have to say about that. There's this group of people who have risen to a kind of strange, somewhat countercultural position of prominence, and there isn't anything obvious about them that's the same, except they're all bipedal. You know, that's about as far as it goes. <laughs> um, but I've, I've been thinking about what might unite them to the degree that that's a reasonable proposition, and I think what it is is that they actually have respect for their audience. And I see that, it's a good thing. Like, you know, my sense is, when I'm lecturing to people, I never lecture down. I'm not trying to make things simpler. I'm trying to make them as, you know, as, I'm trying to communicate them as clearly as I possibly can. But I'm making the assumption that, that everyone is on board and we're going in the same direction, you know? And I think that that's a characteristic of everyone in that group. Like if you look at, well, Shapiro's like that. These are people with very different political perspectives, like Ben Shapiro and Brett Weinstein, for example. It's like they're, they're pretty much on the opposite end of the political distribution. But they, they both assume that the people they're talking to have enough sense to, you know, just that, that the people they're talking to are intelligent and aiming upward. And so when I come and talk to a group like this, I think I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that the best in me is talking to the best in you. And that would be great.
I like this one. If you were to write a work of fiction, what would it be about? Oh, I started writing a work of fiction. It's, it isn't what you'd expect. It's a really brutal, satirical murder mystery. <laughs> it's funny, it's pretty damn dark. I only wrote about, so there's a shock, eh? Um, <laughs> I only wrote about, I wrote about 25 pages of it, and I was, I was really having fun with it. It was kind of a, a satirical, noir, noir detective novel. And then <laughs> I read it to my in-laws at Christmas one year. <laughs> and I, I, oh, I forget, I kind of forget what I'm like, you know, because I'm used to me. <laughs> and I, I read it to my father-in-law and my brother-in-law, and, and my brother-in-law is a pretty straight guy and a conservative guy in, in this sort of Western Alberta, Texas type tradition. And it's like, it's a brutally satirical, Peace, and I read it, and like all that happened was that there was a lot of silence. <laughs> and so, well, so I think that's what would happen if I wrote a piece of fiction because that's what's already happened. So, I don't know if it's a good idea, but you never know, I might finish it sometime. I did enjoy the hell. This theme has been sort of an ongoing one at, at all the shows. Uh, do you foresee a way for the cultural Marxists and the leftists? to be defeated in our culture without actual violence? Well, hopefully not precisely defeated. I don't think it's the right terminology. I think that, I think the person who tells the best story wins. So that's the way forward. It's like, it's not, I don't want it to be, see look, when I went on Bill Maher a while back, I, it was quite interesting because well, I had a conversation with, with, with Mar about my book, and that went pretty well. Because he's a kind of a free speech guy, because he's a comedian, although he's pretty leftist in his views. And, you know, there's a bit of a tension there that he hasn't fully come to terms with, I would say. But people are full of contradictions. Well, people are full of contradictions. But then, at the end of the show, they have this extra period that's only put on YouTube, and I was listening to the four panelists, you know, thrash away at Trump. And it's like, that's a month game, you know, like anybody can do that. And, and so it's just not that interesting to listen to, it's not interesting to listen to celebrities hash away at Trump because they're no more interesting than hearing anyone else do that as far as I'm concerned. And so it's also like shooting fish in a barrel. It's like, well, obviously he has some flaws, right? I mean, so, so pointing them out, it's, it's not an act of brilliance. Seriously not. And, but, That doesn't mean you shouldn't criticize your political leaders, because of course you should. But what I, there was a vitriolic undertone to the commentary that went beyond Trump. And I kept thinking, well, and I'm a Canadian, so I was kind of looking at this from the outside. Although very sympathetic to the US, I've lived here for seven years, and I really like the US. I think it's an amazing place. Uh, it's a remarkable place. Uh, and I was thinking, well, these idiot Trump supporters that you guys are on about, it's like, that's 50% of your nation. Um, it's probably people in your own family. It's certainly people that you work with. They're actually not all stupid, hard as that is to believe, because 50% of the people aren't stupid. And besides that, for the last four elections, 50% of Americans have voted Republican, right? You guys are split exactly down the middle. And so, what are you gonna do? Defeat half your country? Like, what, what the hell good is that? You have to live with these people. And, and they're quite a lot like you. In fact, they, they might be, even be you, for that matter. And so then I think, well, it's with the radical leftists, too. It's like, it would be better to have them drop what they're doing and integrate themselves back into, into the reasonable world and to be guided in that process. And I think the right way to do that is to tell a more compelling story. It's like, Forget about all that resentment and bitterness and oppression narrative and identity politics and racial divide and all of that. It's like, yeah, it's understandable. There are oppressed people in the world. We do have group identities. Everything isn't divided up equally. But that's, that's just not a... I talked to a reporter the other day and all he could do was ask me questions from an identity politics perspective. It was so goddamn dull, I could hardly stand it. <laughs> 
I'm hoping it's a better story. The story of the individual is a better story. So we want to tell it. When will you run for Prime Minister of Canada? <laughs> sovereignty and about personal responsibility, especially to the more conservative types, because they're starting to cotton on to the fact that there's a market for that, you know, for responsibility. But I think I'm far more effective doing what I'm doing now than I would be if I made a lateral move into a political domain. So I don't plan to do that. For the record, I'm pretty sure if Trudeau can do it, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> I did not write this one, but what did you think of Star Wars Episode 8? <laughs> we talked you know, a little Star Wars I, last time I, we were on the show about architects. You know, the problem that I have with the Star Wars programs is that, or the shows is that every one of them is the same movie. And so, I mean, it's well known that, 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 um, now, who, who wrote Star Wars? What's his name? George. Or Lucas. Lucas. Lucas consulted with Joseph Campbell. And Joseph Campbell was a student of Carl Jung's. And there's clearly continual, partially conscious utilization of mythological archetypes in movies like Star Wars. All the big screen and action adventure movies of that sort have a mythological substrate. And, you know, otherwise they would fail because. A story to be great has to be a great story, and if it's a great story, then it's an archetypal story. There's no way around it. It's what makes it a story. So, more power to the Hollywood types for retelling the great stories. Um, I'm not particularly a fan of Star Wars, having said that. Purple hair is more inert. I mean, I can't really argue with them. Uh... <laughs> Given the tremendous amount of effort that goes into raising a child, what do you think of the stay-at-home parenting technique? You mean whether people should stay at home with their children? I guess that's the question. Yeah. Well, I think if you can, that's a good thing. You know, I, I, look, um, the thing about having kids is that, you know, let's say you've got 90 years, something like that, and maybe you have two kids, maybe you have three, but probably not. Two is pretty much the average, and so, that means you have three to six years of little kids, or four to eight years, something like that. That's it. So if you miss it, well, that's it. You missed it. And I would say, don't miss it, because any more than you have to. The problem, you have a little kid, and about six months later, you think, oh, I've always had this little kid. Because you get kind of accustomed to it, but you haven't. And they're not going to be little for very long, and you don't live very long. Like, time passes. The older you get, the faster it passes. And, and your life is not long, and there isn't that much to fill it with, and one of the things to fill it with is little kids. And if you miss it, then it's gone. So I would say, don't let it well miss it. Because it's, there is, see, little kids pay you for taking care of them. They pay you by being happier that you exist than anyone will ever be again in your life, period. Okay, so that's something, that's really something. And they pay you because they're ridiculously comical and playful and, and, and funny. There's, like, little kids are so damn funny, I, and I can't figure that out. They have a sense of humor right from like eight months. You can play little tricks on them, and, and they laugh, and I, I can't figure that out. I can't figure how, how they can be so damn sophisticated. Before they can even talk, they have a good sense of humor. They can do little clowny things, you know, and, and catch on to your jokes. And, and you can play with them, which is 
ridiculous fun and, and something that fathers in particular do with their children, especially rough and tumble play. I just did a talk with Warren Farrell about that. It was quite a good talk, I think. It, it's uh, about the importance of rough and tumble play and, and fathering. And then the other thing that little kids do for you is, you know, you get kind of jaded as you get older. And the reason for that is you stop seeing the world. What you start seeing is your memory of the world. Because as you're in the world longer and longer, you build up representations of the world. And then you look at the world, but the old world only hints at you what representation to use. And so it's like you're just seeing icons of your imagination. That, that's technically what happens. And that's why things don't fill you with a sense of wonder constantly. And there are, there are, there are ways of, of subverting that so the world reappears in all its original glory. It's one of the things that psychedelics do for people. But generally, as you get older, well, that's why you can like about the because they actually renew their perceptions, right? And that can happen radically, and it can happen to a point that's absolutely overwhelming. But little kids have that psychedelic property, because when you're around them, like they're so completely <laughs> blown away by everything that's happening, that you can look at the world through their eyes again, and so that takes you out of your cynicism. And that's also a really good thing. So I would say, it's not so much, well, you have a moral duty to stay home with your kids, although you might. That's not the point. The point is, what the hell do you have to do that's actually better than that? You know, and you think, well, you're going to have to interrupt your career. It's like, well, first of all, most of you don't have careers. You have, <laughs> you have jobs. Right? And more power to you. Like, jobs have to be done. But, but, and then even if you do have a career, and I know this from experience, the probability that your career is more important than the time you spend with your kids is it's vanishingly small. And especially because you can, with difficulty, you can have your cake and eat it too. You can spend lots of time with your kids and you can have your career. So I would say, man, don't miss it. Like, don't miss it because there isn't that much in life that's real and meaningful. And that's one thing that definitely is. So, Psychedelics, the way you can kind of feel the ripple throughout the crowd. Maybe the next tour is like. Well, it is San Francisco, you know what? <laughs> what do you think? We, we wrap this tour and then we do like a trip in with Peterson tour? Yeah. <laughs> Are you worried about becoming a bit of a cult of personality? Well, anyone with any sense would worry about that. You know, I'm so... You know, there's this... <laughs> there's this scene in the life of Brian where, where Brian is at the window. I think he's stark naked, if I remember correctly. And, He's, he's telling all these people who are carrying his shoes and, and his girds around that they're all individuals. And they all chant, yes, we are all individuals. It's like, it's a lovely scene. It's very comical. And uh, it's a great movie. And, but I, like, I don't worry about it that much because I think that encouraging people to develop their individuality is actually not the way that you start a cult. You know, like, the, 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 I'm, I'm serious, I'm, yes, yes, I'm serious about this though too, because you can't just throw around the word cult. Like, cult actually has a pretty tight definition. And there's a bunch of things you have to do if you're gonna lead a cult. Like, you have to separate people from their families. And you have to tell them that everyone outside of the cult is evil. And you have to figure out a way to extract their labor and resources from them. And you have to have a compound up in the hills. And you know, and, and you have to isolate people. Like, there's a lot of work to have a cult. And, and, and the way to have a cult is actually well known. And I'm not doing any of that. And, and I'm, I'm also genuinely, I think, as much as I can tell, and I have some experience with this, I, I really am trying to encourage people to have their lives. And I don't want to tell people how to live their lives, apart from the fact that they should live the lives that are the best that they can conceive of, you know. That, but 
And I partly don't want to tell people how to live their lives because I don't know. One of the things I learned